All right, good evening. I'm going to go ahead and convene the second meeting of 2019 of the Vermont Nuclear Decommissioning Citizens Advisory Panel. I'm your chair, uh, Chris Campany. I'm with the Wyndham Regional Commission, and we'll start to my left at the end. And if everybody just introduce yourself. Yourself? Yourself? Bodecker. I'm the Commissioner for the Department of Environmental Conservation and now the Agency of Natural Resources representative. Bill Irwin for the Department of Health representing the Agency of Human Services. Michael Root representing the Town of Vernon. Bob Leach appointed by the Governor. Uh, Representative Sarah Coffey appointed by, um, uh, serving as a citizen appointee of um, Speaker of the House. I'm Sebastian Guillo. I'm here to support North Star and representing Orono uh, in charge of uh, some of the reactor D&D uh, &D work. I'm Corey Daniels with North Star. I'm David Pearson with North Star. Allison Wana with the Department of Public Service. I'm Gerald Noyce with the Waste Management Division and work for Emily. And before we introduce Derek, uh, is there, uh, Tony, is there anybody on the phone from the panel? Not, not that I can see right now. Uh, it looks like we have uh, Justin Colbert from the Attorney General's office and uh, one other private citizen. Okay. Who was the first person? I'm sorry. Uh, Justin Colbert from Attorney General's office. Okay. Is he on the panel? Yes. No. He, he's not a member of the panel. Could, could if, if he... I'm trying to think of the meeting law. Because if you're a member of the panel, we would have to do a roll call vote. What's that? What's the feedback? Wait. 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 Okay. So, uh, as I recall, under open meeting law, we have a lot of attorneys here, so I would, look, I would welcome any help. But it'd be if a member of the panel is on the phone, we'd have to do roll call votes, right? Not, not, a, not a member of the public. Uh, that's my understanding, and right now we do not have m any members of the panel on the phone. Everybody in agreement with that? Yes, okay. Sir. And we have some other people join us. Derek? You want to Hi, I'm Derek Jordan. I'm a citizen member. Lisa Weinman, by um, Tim Ash. Thank you. Yeah. Tony, is that somebody right on the mute? I, I think that is. Uh, folks on the phone, if you can mute your lines, we're getting some feedback in the room. Okay, great. Okay, um, so the first item on the agenda is uh, January 2019 meeting minutes review and approval. Can I get a motion for approval? Motion Corey, okay, second? Second. Bob, any discussion? Uh, Sarah? So I, I was not at this meeting, but I noticed that there were, so I was really closely reading the minutes. Um, and I noticed that there were on page five of the minutes, the public questions and comments, um, uh, questions from the public that were listed. Were there any, were those questions answered? And if so, could we include some of those responses in the minutes or were they just rhetorical questions? We could hear you. Okay, um, what I was told to do with the minutes going with the Chatham House minutes is that we, uh, we record questions, but we do not necessarily record answers. Uh, I know there's in the past, there's been some criticism on how long the minutes have gotten. And one of the reasons why the minutes have gotten long is that we do have uh, long answers, um, multiple, you know, additional counterpoints to answers that previously were being captured. Uh, I'll remind people that 
uh, you know, these meetings are recorded via video, so if there is a, uh, you know, if you want to know what the answer is to a specific question, the meeting video is available. Do no. you have a preference, Sarah? No, I, it just might be nice to put that in the minutes, though, if, like, responses to the questions, the way that, that it's been done in other sections of the minutes. Okay, uh, I that, that don't have the minutes in front of me, so I, I'm not sure so what go, you're going referring forward to. Or for the, or for this, uh, Moving forward, I mean, I think this is the public re the public's record of our meetings, and and it seems that it would be uh, this and to be transparent about what's going on. It would just be important, even to, I understand that the, the minutes were getting long and lengthy. I read some of those, so <coughs> I can appreciate that. But it would be good to have a link to some of the information, so even if it's a reference to the. Um, the, the 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 recording. So basically, capturing the essence of the response, not not a not the transcript of the response. Not a transcript, but I think it's important to have some either a reference point or some kind of brief summary. Okay. If it's not too much trouble. Everybody else okay with that? Yes. All right. For this set of minutes, do you, are you okay? Do you need to, need us to go back? I don't think we need to. No, I don't think we need to go back. But I just think it would be a good practice going forward. Okay. All right, can I have a vote on the minutes? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Okay, the minutes have been approved, thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is state evaluation of North Star required annual report. Um, I'll give just a brief intro to this. Uh, under the um, Public Utility Commission docket, uh, well, uh, under the uh, uh, um, the board order. Um, there's a re report that required at the end of March and it goes from North Star to the state and of course since the transfer of ownership didn't take place until January this one is fairly brief so um, I'll t turn it over to uh, turn it over to you. Hello. Okay, last time I wasn't close enough to the microphone, so I'm trying to do better. Um, thank you. I'm Allison Bates Wanup here from the Department of Public Service. I'm going to talk briefly about um, the disclosures that were required to be made under the docket 8880. Uh, Memorandum of Understanding, referred to as the MOU. Um, as you likely all know, this also relates to elements of the Nuclear Decommissioning Trust and the Site Restoration Trust. So um, as Chris just stated, the transaction only closed on January 11th, and so uh, a lot of the requirements didn't strictly apply based on that. So we worked with Northstar to obtain reporting that reflected the current state of the decommissioning. So these materials are due to be received annually on March 31st and to cover the previous calendar year. Um, so we received the materials on March 29th. There's two disclosures. The first under MOU section 2H is made to the department, the Agency of Natural Resources, Vermont Department of Health, as well as the Attorney General's Office. Um, and the second section, MOU section 2I, is to only the department. And I have copies of these materials available up here if you want to see them. Uh, they will also be available on the department's website later. So. So under Section 2I, this is an annual pub, uh, public certification. The first requirement is essentially under Section 2H1, a detailed description of all work completed as of that date pursuant to the corrective action plans approved by ANR. As of that date, we didn't have any corrective action plans uh, approved. Um, the next section under 2H2, a detailed description and schedule of the remaining corrective actions and site restoration work. Um, so on February 19th, North Star submitted a complete work plan to ANR, which ANR then reviewed, and they conducted a site tour on March 15th, and this was the substance of what this disclosure was stating. ANR will be speaking later about uh, what it has seen in its oversight role. Um, the next section, 2H3, uh, asks 
for the amount of funds available in the site restoration as of the end of the calendar year. Um, the site restoration trust fund as of January 11th had over $60 million pursuant to the agreements related to the closing. Um, and the final 2H4 was the amount of funds estimated to be required to complete site restoration and uh, North Star continues to estimate that amount at $25 million. Uh, the, moving on to the next set of disclosures, and these were more financial disclosures and, the, and reports, and these were submitted only to the Department of Public Service. Um, these were audited financials for North Star Group Holdings and North Star Group Services for the preceding calendar year. Uh, we received, we agreed to receive these materials by April 30th because North Star is adjusting its auditing schedule, um, but we in fact received them by April 13th or April 17th. Um, and then under the next section, section 2I2, the audited statements of the Nuclear Decommissioning Trust and Site Restoration Trust Fund balances with current investment mix. So um, there were no audited statements covering the prior calendar year because North Star did not own the assets then, um, but North Star provided two trustee statements um, as of January 31st and February 28th, 2019. Uh, next, we had the, um, the next requirement was a schedule of both the cumulative historic and projected fund activity for both trust funds, as well as an updated pay item disbursement schedule and an update of the current deal model through, um, and so North Star provided copies of these and we, you know, everything that we see, nothing is over budget, or anything so far. So um, the variance analysis, comparing the actual disbursements to, uh, compared to the estimates. Um, since 2019 is gonna be the first year of activity, this requirement didn't strictly apply either. So as Chris was saying, these kind of circumstances <laughs> made it a little thinner of a report. Um, so that is my c information regarding the annual reports. What I'm next going to move into is the next item on the agenda as it relates to the department about um, what we, our oversight role is we are getting, ramping that up. So um, one of the things we've been seeing is disbursements from, just wanted to give you updates on disbursements from the Nuclear Decommissioning Trust and the Site Restoration Trust. So we're, these are coming out about once a month. The um, North Star has to give the NRC 30 days notice before disbursements and all of the money for both the Site Restoration Trust and the Nuclear Decommissioning Trust is a request to be paid money for work that has already been completed. Um, and so the table up there is of the amounts that have already, that were the date that the 30 day pre-notice was um, submitted to the NRC and those are just for the Nuclear Decommissioning Trust. There have been no disbursements yet from the Site Restoration Trust. So but we know that that balance is around 60 million and the NDT is around roughly 530, 528. Um, and like I said, these are all for just disbursements that were already completed. Um, other updates, uh, we selected our consultant after a rigorous selection process. We're still finalizing the contract. So I'll give more information about that next time. But before we, when we were here, we were talking about the request for proposals to um, obtain a consultant to help us in exercising our oversight role. We initially posted the request for proposals and received uh, four responses. And we decided that we wanted to really see more from the range of potential respondents out there. So we canceled and reissued the RFP and shopped it more aggressively and ended up receiving 13 responses and had a lot of very qualified candidates to talk to. Um, we are reformatting the uh, NDCAP website or the department's website to have an express decommissioning page and NDCAP will be part of that. Um, North Star is hiring a uh, consultant regarding public engagement so we'll be working with them going forward. Um, and we also recently received and are reviewing the annual radiological effluent release report and the annual radiological environmental operating report. Um, I will be handing it over now to, I think, ANR or the Department of Health. Mm -hmm. 
So the health department has nothing to report at this time. Do you want to use them out? I guess I need to All right. Oh, you got to put Hello. Okay, I'm Gerald Noyce. I'm the I'm uh, a project manager for the wait, project manager for the waste management division. We're uh, a division of the DEC. And, uh, Ms. Bodecker is is my boss, so I'm here to report on what we're doing for environmental uh, work. Um, the nuclear work is overseen by the NRC, so the state has an interest in many making sure that the site is cleaned up of non-nuclear uh, waste. I mean, it is a big industrial site. Um, so in February, we met with North Star and their environmental consultant, Haley and Aldrich. Uh, we also uh, hired a uh, technical support uh, environmental consultant. They do called ATC Group Services. They have multiple offices around the country. And uh, they have people both in Massachusetts and in Vermont that are helping us out. In March, uh, we did a site tour with North Star, Haley Aldrich, and ATC just to get the lay of the land. Um, uh, Allison said that there were some um, work plans submitted under the MOU, and this is kind of a limit, a um, this is the kind of a list of work plans. There was the non-radiological site sampling plan, which had appendices for uh, investigating the subsurface, the foundations, the underground tunnels, that kind of thing. Uh, there will be fill brought on site, so there's a plan for testing the fill. Uh, there's a groundwater monitoring plant, and then there's a concrete reuse plant. Some of the uh, the intake structure and the, um, the for the cooling water, some of that is going to potentially be ground up and kept on site as clean concrete fill. There's a building characterization completion report that was kind of the initial characterization of the buildings for hazardous materials, lead paint, asbestos, things like that. And then there's a quality assurance project plan that is basically the plan that says how North Star and Haley and Aldridge are going to be <coughs> sampling and how they are going to be collecting all their samples and what they're going to do with them. Those draft plans have been, all right. Okay, it's, there we go. Come on. There we go. Those draft plans were reviewed by the DEC. Uh, Department of Health for the building characterization part, and then ATC. We've sent comments back to Haley and Aldrich. They've responded, and we're reviewing those revisions right now. The technical support contractor basically is another set of eyes that are reviewing our um, assessment of these work plans. Uh, they've also um, reviewed the asbestos survey report and have gone on site and basically confirmed that the North Star asbestos report reports what is out there, although they have asked for a couple other samples and materials. We've also been working on what is called a, a post-closure site restoration protocols. That's under the MOU, and that lists some of the things that North Star uh, and the state are going to agree to on just how we exchange information, how we get site access, uh, things like that. We're basically, right, and that's in a draft form right now in review with the um, Agency of Natural Resources and the Department of Health. And that just kind of goes over things like site restoration, remediation, notifications, and then future work. I've got listed, we're 
we will continue to be reviewing work plans and submissions from North Star uh, or Haley and Aldridge. Right now, um, asbestos abatement work is going on at the cooling towers and then will be happening in, in the turbine building and Corey can certainly explain in more detail how that's working. But we do have our consultant ATC providing some um, um, their reviews of the asbestos abatement, um, uh, which are the asbestos um, sampling, and they will be on site occasionally to uh, observe the asbestos abatement. Uh, asbestos is a DOH, a Department of Health program, so uh, they too will have their asbestos inspectors, but we do have uh, ATC that has some expertise in that field. They'll be also used for other things, but right now um, asbestos abatement is kind of a primary thing as that has to be done before buildings start coming down. And finally, the other thing will be there is environmental sampling going on of groundwater, of soil, and at some point we'll have ATC uh, splitting samples with Haley and Aldridge and their consultants. So basically the state will have it, some idea or will be able to tell are the samples being correct, correctly taken, are the results comparable. And uh, it's, a, you know, it's a state being able to verify what is happening out there. So, and that's what I have to say. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Um, so next we will turn to North Star uh, to give an update on VOI site decommissioning activities followed by a presentation by Arano on reactor sec vessel segmentation and then we'll be taking questions from the panel and the public. So Corey and David, you guys want to start? Let me know if the glare off my head is too bright. <laughs> Do we have your slides? We don't have your slides, right? Uh, I gave them to Tony. He's emailing. You don't have them on paper. Okay. So you probably have to turn around as well. So again, I'm Corey Daniels at North Star Decommissioning LLC. I'm the ISFISI Senior Manager. Um, last time we were here, we talked a little bit about an induction, introduction to North Star and what we'd like to see for this meeting and future meetings. Uh, we discussed a little bit of major status updates and the schedule. We talked a little bit about our near-term objectives and some of the priorities that we're developing. We obviously talked about the arrangements with respect to uh, docket 8880, which you just heard a bunch of the details from both the legal counsel and uh, and our representative. But the big work that's coming up is the vessel segmentation work. And that's why I brought one of the principal senior uh, project managers from Murano, who's doing most of that work on site with support from North Star. And I'm gonna step through the slides to update you from our schedule and discussions from the last meeting. I'm also gonna talk a little bit about the detail for the segmentation work, but it'll be at the 10,000 foot level. And if people have specific questions, uh, Sebastian goes here to answer anything in as much detail as folks would like. So last time we spoke, we talked about aligning the refill floor to accommodate the work that was coming up. We talked about checking out all the cranes and the equipments that we were used. We were setting them into layup, but we knew we'd have to make some modifications and operate all of those tools. We talked about cleaning up the spent fuel pool and then reflooding the reactor vessel. Most of that work will happen underwater. We also talked about getting inside of the containment structure where the reactor vessel is located and all the detailed work that would happen in there to set up the tooling. As far as the project schedule goes, I showed you folks this slide last time. We looked at bringing more of a level two or three style schedule in, but the waterfall is so compressed that it really isn't valuable. I will tell you the schedule and the targets haven't really changed. We're on track 
and this shows the major components that will have to come out and the bulk work that will continue and the level of detail we talk to will show you some of the finer points of what's happening. So really we're still in that first section there. We're done with the trifle storage. We're starting on the large components and the vessel work. And some of the other items we talked about, right? we just basically absorbed Vermont Yankee as North Star. The work processes and the infrastructure had to adapt to make sure that the things that existed at this site would work in North Star's arena of operation. We put all our schedules together so it's one project, not five or six different projects, which is kind of how it was when North Star took over. We've been working through all the logistics and the details with Gerald and his staff to make sure that the operation surrounding characterization and any uh, remediation with the plan that was being approved is working and we appreciate their efforts as they've allowed us to step forward into some of that work as Gerald mentioned and uh, drill some extra holes and get the sampling started and commence the characterization that will allow some of the demolition work to, to commence soon. Um, some small changes to the facility management infrastructure just for safety. If you've been to the site and you've been there in previous years, you know it's a lot different getting into the facility. The controls change due to the status with the Code of Federal, Federal Regulations that apply to it. And we're looking to even upgrade that a little bit more as more activity happens on the site. And we talked about the new rail spur getting completed. That is done. We're actually in the process of erecting a large temporary structure. It's 100 feet long, 80 feet wide, and it spans the railroad tracks and allows us to do a lot of the loading operations undercover. Uh, if anybody noticed, it's rained a little bit this spring, so that would be handy. <laughs> um, we've also put out a, a new pad where we'll have a horizontal storage structure that's done. And we also did some demolition. We used to have a construction office building. It's where the cafeteria and some of the, the people places were. That's all been taken down. We'll show you some photos of that. And we've also been preparing the cooling tower. So one of the things Joe mentioned was the asbestos containing material, making sure that we are certain we've identified all those items and they get remediated ahead of the major demolition for the cooling towers. And as he also mentioned, we're looking at all the targets of opportunity within the turbine building. Uh, we we want to optimize our resources while they're here and get them started on that as soon as possible so we just know how big that scope is and where it makes the most sense to start and spend their energy. So real live photo, this is the containment structure head as we pull that up. That's now cut into pieces and packaged ready for shipment. A uh, little difficult to see, but if you got polarized glasses on and you can tell underwater, it looks like there's a whole bunch of uh, racks, modular racks inside the cement fuel pool. You also notice the large tackle and block for the reactor building crane is partially submerged in water. That was actually live footage of them lifting one of the racks out of the water to decontaminate it and package it for disposal as well. Um, across the bottom, you'll see the little arrows, and that kind of discusses the flow of events that have to happen. It's, it's kind of technical. I'm not going to read each of those to you, but you'll see that through a number of the next set of slides. That's a cutaway model of a GE BWR Mark I reactor vessel. You can tell it's pretty big. It's almost 60 feet tall. It, it weighs a lot. Uh, just the head that gets lifted off of it is enormous. and. Uh, and it is also very thick where the flange bolts together. So mostly the way this works is we take the lid off, it's already flooded up with water, we take out some of the components that are still in there, and then we kind of work our way down. Uh, the top core plate and then a bunch of the other components that are inside get chopped up, specifically packaged after they're cut into precise sizes and then boxed up for shipment. One of the nice things about having Orono here is they have a lot of experience in this field. They've done some advanced 3D modeling. They're very much aware of what it's going to take to do this. And we also have detailed radiological surveys conducted so we know the activation levels of the components. We know how much storage space they're going to take and we know how we're going to have to handle them. More than that, they have some very specialized tooling for doing this work. Um, you're going to hear the term sequences. Uh, generally, that's a, a segment of work 
efforts that will be conducted, uh, kind of like a prerequisite for starting into the next set of sequences. So if there are detailed questions, uh, Sebastian will be able to talk about that a little bit. I mentioned the custom boxes, uh, pretty elaborate fabrication for those. They're enormous, they're quite heavy, they're shielded, and they're sized precisely to fit the components as they come out and get stacked in the correct geometry. I won't read the rest of the slide to you, but you get the idea. It's a, it's a lot goes into this. And this is an example of one of the sequences that's uh, the upper left-hand picture is the upper core paint. And this is what it'll look like after it's all cut up. Most of the activities will happen inside the reactor vessel underwater, which is connected to our spent fuel pool. A number of the things will get handled either in there or over in the dryer separator pit. This entire cavity is all one big tank of water with the reactor building crane able to access all areas of it. But it's kind of a choreography of removing equipment, cutting it up, staging it for removal, getting it removed and packaged, and then making room to do it again with the next set of pieces. I'm gonna get into some of the specialized equipment here. Uh, this water abrasive suspension system, we call the WAS, has a couple of different configurations. This one is a large mass. It allows it to basically travel vertically. Uh, all of this is remotely operated, and, and most of this will happen underwater. They have another mode of operation for this where it's basically on a 3D jig, and it can be positioned pretty much any way on two axes in very precise uh, locations. Uh, to give you an idea of the level of precision, they've actually selected datums up on the refuel floor so they could if effectively uh, measure to within, I think it's about three-eighths of an inch, everything that's going to get cut. A modified bandsaw, very specialized tooling, works underwater, used to cut some of the cylindrical components. Other specialized equipment, watching these operate, uh, doesn't sound all that fancy, but it's pretty neat to see in person as a huge diamond wire saw. It's for large geometries that are very difficult to get around. Basically, you have tensioners and they run the band all the way around components and they turn it on. Stand back and watch it cut through something as thick as the reactor vessel head. It's pretty neat. And again, some other specialized tooling, circular saws. Uh, some of these are a little bit smaller, so they can get down into the harder to reach locations. And they have a number of adaptations, different wheel sizes and, and things they can use to clamp it in place. And then we get into some of the more specialized tooling, uh, a split lathe cutter uh, that's really for cutting the large diameter pipes that are attached to the sides of the reactor vessel from the outside. So I mentioned the spent fuel pool was empty. You can see it's completely cleaned out there and we're actually coating it with a fixative so any loose surface contamination that may have remained stays in place and they can use it as a working uh, space, either dry or wet. Some of the operations will do dry first and then we'll flood it up and do it underwater. I mentioned the containment vessel head. Now this is the actual reactor vessel head. Uh, and that's the 60 ton, very heavy uh, steel head clad in stainless, and I can't remember the exact dimensions. I think it said it was uh, 22 inches thick at the flange or 11 inches thick at the flange. It's a very big, heavy chunk of steel. We're actually working on that right now, looking at setting new center of gravity lift points in it so we can segment it and safely lower it down from the top of the building. So the last remaining components that are highly activated, we call them greater than class C. Uh, it's a small amount. If you recall from previous handicaps and when we talked about loading the spent fuel into the stainless steel uh, multi-purpose canisters, there is a multi-purpose canister inside of this vessel. It's actually called a non-waste fuel container. It's identical to the multi-purpose canisters. That's where all the remaining components that are greater than class C will go. This is actually an interim vessel. This is what gets lowered in and out of the spent fuel pool so the work can be done underwater. And then it gets set above this ice storm, which is similar to all the casts you see out on the is fizzy pad now, with the exception that there are no vents on the top and bottom because this greater than class C 
well highly irradiated generates no heat or extremely low amounts of it but it will end up on the SVZ pad with all the spent fuel as well and uh, obviously with all the shielding uh, and the components in here it will have a appreciable but very small effect on the total dose component of the SVZ pad I mentioned there were 17 custom boxes and they're designed with very tight tolerances and specific for all the components that will be cut up. Um, here's pictures of them staged outside ready for use. You get an idea how big they are. All these items will ship on rail. Some of these boxes alone weigh, I think, close to 30 tons. We also have a horizontal transfer station. Uh, this is effectively a big concrete vault where some of the materials will be stored. They'll be transferred in and out of it horizontally. Uh, that's just a representation that's not actually on the site, as are these drawings as well. Mm -hmm. And we have specialized transport casts that can slide in and out of those, and also transport by rail. I mentioned that the rail was upgraded. There's an actual uh, picture right outside my office. It's really nice. The train links honk the horn a lot to remind us where it is, which happens to be right outside my window. But I know everybody's safe <laughs> and uh, they're busy. So the rail spur travels this way and goes right into the turbine building and then it travels this way and goes around the south end of the site where that temporary structure I mentioned is being erected. You can see the cooling towers in the distance there. Um, that is actually one of the components of the horizontal transfer station arriving by rail mm -hmm. out my office window. Um, I mentioned that we demolished the construction office building. You can see the excavator going to work on it right there. And that's what it looked like after it's all cleaned up. And in the background, you can see the horizontal transfer system uh, with a worker on top of it, finishing off some of the construction activities. And there's a close up of that unit. Um, I took this picture of the cooling towers, uh, I guess about a week and a half ago. I will tell you those fan shrouds have now been lifted off and we're pretty close with the uh, characterization and ready to commence all the abatement for asbestos and I predict at the next indicat meeting I'll be showing you where those used to be <coughs> so that was my presentation and I will open the floor to uh, any questions and if they're specific to the vessel segmentation I invite Sebastian to provide any information necessary all right any questions from the panel for Anybody who just presented from the state or from North Star? Mm -hmm. Anybody from the panel? Going once, going twice? Okay, must have been a very thorough presentation. Okay, from the public, if you would, please uh, form a line back over by the podium. Okay. <laughs> Um, well, we're at a break, so we will take a five minute break and reconvene. So um, now we're going to be discussing uh, issue committee recommendations on topics to be addressed by the panel in 2019. Um, so Tony sent out to everyone, I do believe, um, a uh, summary of the uh, Issues Committee, and I've got too many pieces of paper here sitting in front of me. So it's underneath the agenda. Tony, when did you email that out? It's two weeks ago, if I remember correctly now. I, I can look in my email archive if you need an exact date. That's okay. Yeah. So do panel members remember seeing that? Raise your hand if you don't remember seeing that. I'm seeing generally nods, no shakes, but okay. So um, a summary of the discussion, if you um, look at page five, where it's summarized potential items for future meetings. Um, that's the last heading on page five. 
Um, above that, you'll see summary of items selected for the May NDCAP meeting agenda, which we're going through right now. Um, but the potential items for future meetings, so the site, uh, the uh, issues committee met um, on Monday, April 22nd at the Office of Wyndham Regional Commission um, and uh, basically went over what additional topics should we cover in 2019 um, and then also later. Um, and for 2019, these are summarized here also on the uh, on the agenda, uh, further discussing what the panel role is and annual reporting requirements as part of its public information and engagement mm -hmm. function, the panel role and state oversight agency communication to inform and engage the public, and revisit legislation that created the panel, including the role, composition, operation, and administrative support for the panel. And other potential items for future meetings, uh, Vermont Yankee um, non-radiological site characterization, uh, continued discussion of panel role and annual reporting requirements, uh, purpose of uh, proposed modifications of uh, panel enabling legislation and panel charter, uh, recommend a single common state website for all Vermont Yankee reporting requirements so that people don't have to wander from site to site, um, define role and function of NDCAP as means by which state oversight agencies can educate and inform public discussion and receive comments from the public, uh, specific informational needs for newer panel members, uh, continuation of panel NEMA participation. Tony, uh, can you spell out that acronym for us? I'm sorry. Oh, H before it. Yes, Nuclear it, Energy it, Innovation it, yeah. and Modernization Act requirements. And that's the, uh, if, if folk may have read in the paper, we discussed it briefly, I think, before where uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission is having meetings around the country to uh, select, to take, informa take in input information about uh, citizen advisory panel best practices. Is that a good characterization? That's a good summary, yeah. Okay. Um, hear from the town of Vernon about its planning efforts that would inform site reuse options from a town plan policy perspective and what that means for site restoration. Um, and uh, have an annual report from the Texas Low Level Radioactive Waste Compact. So those, that's a summary of the uh, issues that the Issues Committee identified. And um, what a fault thing. Now this is just the start, this isn't the beginning. Does that seem like good fodder for the remainder of 2019? Yes. Yes. Anything missing? <clears throat> Go ahead. Nope. You don't have, what happened to your microphone? Uh, they, they, they took, took it away. away. Everything's a little screwed up here tonight. <laughs> this. Um, so. I guess I wasn't able to make the issues committee meeting and I regret that I was um, away but I do feel that um, I would like to see us get more um, continuous input from our federal legislators about the state of the radioactive waste policy in general I mean I know it's it's not necessarily um, strictly within our purview as a panel but um, I continue to be concerned that there, in the absence of um, an actual United States policy on nuclear waste disposal and the lack of a site, um, even an interim site at this point, that it behooves us to be in pretty constant contact with our federal legislators and getting updates as to different bills that are being um, constantly uh, brought up in the Congress that would affect the future of the ISFC and um, those casks here in, in Vernon. Um, so I would, I would say that I, I would like to see um, our federal legislators here and, and give us um, updates, um, probably an update on that state of play. Any response to Alyssa's suggestion? <coughs> 
think I can provide a little bit of update on the status of what's going on with Yucca Mountain right now. The feds just recently funded a continuation of that particular project and uh, licensing is supposed to be processed by the NRC and they put money out there for that. Uh, and they've also directed the DOE uh, to establish interb storage sites. They didn't say where, but I think they implied that they would like to have it at Yucca Mountain. So once they've got it down there, why then uh, they won't have to go very far to be disposed of. But that's just from recent articles I have read uh, just in the last couple of months. Thanks, Bob. Uh, so any, any comments on having, uh, I, I, would, I would assume we were talking about staff from the federal delegation providing an update at uh, each, indi each IndyCap meeting, is that what you're proposing? I would propose that, yes. Any other thoughts? Or do people like the idea, not like the idea? I like the idea. <laughs> June Tierney here. I, I like the idea too. Um, I, I would keep in mind that we can ask. That, that doesn't mean that they can necessarily come to every meeting, but that seems like a pretty uh, smart step to me. Okay, so without seeing any other shaking of heads, I'm assuming we've got general consensus on that? Okay, great. Um, this is all going very smoothly tonight, mm -hmm. so. Okay, um, <laughs> I wonder if it's part part of the purview of the panel to comment on things like legislation that would establish an interim consolidated storage site, whether that in fact is in our best interest as a community. Um, that might speak to one of the um, upcoming discussion points regarding the role of the panel moving forward. I would say that, you know, Yucca Mountain is a discussion that's been going on for decades and billions and billions of dollars and doesn't seem likely to ever really actually provide the solution that we're interested in. And there are other models that we might actually look at as a community if we're going to be having that waste stored here for um, a long period of time, whether it in fact makes sense to um, put our uh, our support behind the concept of interim consolidated storage, which um, many people, um, many groups have said uh, is not in, in the best interest of taxpayers because it implies moving waste twice, once to an interim facility and then at some unidentified time in the future to an actual consolidated uh, storage site permanent ge geologic repository, which is what the current law still calls for unless it's changed. So as a panel and as a community that's dealing with having this nuclear waste in our midst that we have to um, basically guard and live with uh, for the foreseeable future, I wonder if it, if it um, is wise for us to consider other potential options other than inter interim consolidated storage because it is so costly um, just to the nation at large to do that. So what, um, we can discuss this now, another, op another way to proceed with that, uh, Alyssa, would be to actually propose a, an advisory position. Any panelist can draft up an advisory position for consideration by the panel and so actually articulating it um, and it doesn't have to be long I mean like it can be I mean, it can be as long as it needs to be but if you want to articulate that I mean, feel free to collaborate with your colleagues just don't uh, as long as we don't, don't have a quorum I have to warn it uh, but you can definitely talk to, to your colleagues and help form uh, an advisory opinion or a draft um, does anybody else want to discuss that now If somebody does draft it, I'll be, if somebody does draft it, I will be more than willing to uh, review it. I'm kind of familiar with the whole process, how it started, how it got where we are now. 
and where the money's coming from that's paying for it. It's not so much taxpayers as it is ratepayers, but it's semantics. Uh, and Yucca Mountain, it's important to remember that at one time Vermont was one of the states that was considered poor that site. And Congress at the time decided to put it in Yucca Mountain for the same reason that Vermont was considered. It's a, not a very large population and the feds own most of the land in Nevada. So they just, they thought that was a nice place to put it. <clears throat> Since then we had a few congressmen that had enough power so that they could stop it. So the whole time uh, Obama was in office why Reed stopped all activity to process the licensing for Yucca Mountain. Since that has ended why things have started up again, they have been working on the license and they have funded continuing to work at Yucca Mountain now. That's Thanks a subject up. near and dear to my heart. I tried to stay on top of that issue. I would like to suggest that we get together and talk about it because I am aware that this panel has already taken a position on interim consolidated waste. It's taken a, a position in support, but it was never brought to the attention of the panel at large. It was just done de facto in a letter that was signed by Kate and uh, I guess Martin when, when they were chair and co-chair, joining with some of the other Yankees. Um, and I have a copy of that letter. I believe it's part of the, um, the record on the site. But I always took issue um, with the fact that they, they didn't really understand what they were signing frankly and even um, when I discussed it with them later it was like well you know it's everybody wants to see the waste go as soon as possible which is not going to be very soon we already know that but the fact is here there's a lot of different um, ideas and Yucca Mountain is on a Native American reservation site so was never the federal government's land to begin with that's only one of many hundreds of issues that are problematic with Yucca Mountain beyond the politics of uh, in 1982 or whenever it was identified. There were no people much in Nevada, but now there's a lot more people in Nevada. So yes, the politics changed, but the primary concern with that central repository were, were geologic problems with the formation itself. That said, even if we were to put all the, the current nuclear waste in Yucca Mountain right now, it would already be filled and we'd be looking for a second repository. So that is just the, the, the fact of the matter. So I just, I just think that there's, um, it bears consideration. Maybe um, Corey and Bob, we could get together and look and just sort of examine this issue and see whether it might make sense as a panel to take a closer look at what interim consolidated waste facilities might imply um, for our community. And I'll just offer, uh, we had previously, uh, the panel had previously adopted an advisory opinion on um, asking the, the federal government basically to convene host communities. The Wyndham Regional Commission, which I'm happy to share this, uh, we had drafted an advisory opinion suggesting not only uh, to convene host communities that uh, where, where plants exist or, or had existed, uh, to discuss not only the impacts of you know, decommissioning policy, but to also to convene uh, potential host communities of re that would receive nuclear waste. Because um, one of the issues that keeps coming up is um, that some of the sending communities say this stuff is really bad, while we're expecting other receiving communities to say this stuff is really good for us. And so actually having a, com a communication, a, a direct dialogue between host communities both receiving and sending um, would probably be really helpful and insightful for uh, federal policy. So if you guys want to see that um, that draft opinion, happy to share it. It's, Wyndham Regional Commission's already taken that position, but that's but not the panel. So um, okay. So are you suggesting that the panel might wish to take a position on that Wyndham Regional Commission advisory, or was there a reason it was never voted on? I don't think we ever. I don't know if we ever actually got around to introducing that one. So, but I drafted. I mean, it, it's, we've been sh we've been Wyndham Regional has been sharing it all around the world, <laughs> not all around the world, but just we've been sharing it pretty broadly. So, would you like to see the panel take a position on, in support of the Wyndham Regional Commission's position on that, if possible? You know, as chair, I'm going to defer to the panel. 
So if you guys would like to see that, <laughs> it's one of the reasons I'll be glad I'm not chair I would anymore. Like to see that. I, would, I would make a motion that we take a look at your advisory opinion and, and, and uh, consider approving it. I don't know if you need a motion. I think you can just bring, bring we can bring it at the next as uh, introduce it at the next meeting. If if I, mean, I think other people should look at it and then see if you feel like bringing it to the to the panel. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so uh, I'm looking at the agenda here. So next we're we are taking public comments on the role and composition of IndyCap going forward. So if anybody has any thoughts, if you line up over here at the microphone and uh, sure, Sarah. Um, I just I, I appreciate the 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 issues group getting together. I I I think it's really important that we bring the town of Vernon and give them a really strong voice in all of this as, as this work is going forward. So, whatever I would to figure out the best way to do that with the town. Um, so it would. Got Michael Root and we have Bob Michael. Leach. Yep, and I think it's you know in bringing that figuring out a process. For that, for some, whether it's the planning commission in town or the select board, um, but I, I think that will be really important. We actually did that during the meeting because uh, Corey had actually uh, made a suggestion that directly affected Vernon, and so we directed um, Michael to, or Michael agreed that he would take that to the town, specifically to the planning commission and select board. So I think we've got a good process, but anybody is welcome to attend. Okay, oh, Corey, go ahead. Wait, wait, wait. One other point of business uh, from the charter, we were required to have an IBW representative on the panel. Otherwise, we all recall we lost Dave Andrews. And while there's no IBW workers at the site currently, I did reach out to the uh, local 300 to Tim Watson in Vermont. Um, I was a long time IBW member. I had a discussion with Tim Watson. He was happy to continue to have IBW representation through myself on the panel, which I can provide in writing if required, or also to eliminate IBW from the required representation since they no longer have a stakehold with employment. I just wanted to know that was followed up on and Great. we have that outcome. Gene, did you have something? I'm, I'm kind of thinking I probably uh, should just let this go, but um, I, I just wanted to provide a bookend to the discussion we just had. Um, the panel considering taking a position is not the same as the panel agreeing to take a position. And for me personally, um, a consideration is what is legitimately within the scope of this panel to do. And I think that's part of the discussion that we're going to have as we talk about the future of the panel. I just want to put a flag in that. I'm, I'm not sure that I see it as expansively as you do, Lisa. So I think just before we go back to the public comment, um, I think the, the idea is, and what we talked about the issues committee, and you guys remind, correct me if I'm wrong, but the idea is when, before we next convene, the issues committee would again get together and, and begin actually fleshing out um, proposals for uh, panel scope, panel composition, those questions and bring that to the next two meetings of the panel that we that we have this year um, and so that's why right now they're open questions um, and uh, so there'll be plenty of other times to bite at this apple and I'll say that you know right now the goal is just have some solid recommendations for the legislature uh, for the new year but it could be that you know, this that may be a couple of step process you know right so we could, we've got time we could take the time that we need to take to get it right. Um, so our, our agenda and our goals and deadlines and all are our own to set. So, um, but that's the idea is the issues committee would get together. The issue committee meetings are warned and anyone is, enter, is invited uh, to attend. The public, general public is invited to attend. So now we'll go to public comment. I'm Ann Darling. Um, I live in East Hampton, Massachusetts, although I've lived in this area for a very long time before I moved. Um, so, uh, Commissioner Tierney, I've actually left a note with Tony. Um, I would love to see um, a Mass Massachusetts person on this panel, and there is supposed to be one, um, and the person resigned a few years ago, but nobody on the panel knows that. So. Um, but now they do because I found out. So 
perhaps Governor Baker could be given a little nudge to appoint someone. Um, and I, uh, I guess the other thing I want to say apropos to the, um, the disposal is I do feel that um, we as a community benefited, if you will, from the, from the uh, electricity generated here at the Vermont Yankee. And that I feel, I personally feel that we have a responsibility for the consequences of that benefit um, and to understand uh, where the waste that was generated here is going and how it's going to affect other people in, our, in the world and uh, in our country. Um, so that I'm, that's just my two cents worth on that. Um, yep, yes, yeah, there's a question for you. Real quick, would you be willing to serve if I give uh, Governor Baker your name? If you did what? If I give Governor Baker your name, would you be willing to serve? <laughs> no, I'm serious. I, I actually have thought about that, Commissioner, and um, I feel like somebody who has the ear of the governor <coughs> perhaps should be on the panel. You know, like Paul Mark was on the panel. He's a state rep. Somebody who is closer in to the government. I see. But perhaps you could contact my office with that kind of information so I can get that to Governor Scott. Governor Baker. No, Governor Scott would be oh. my contact to Governor Baker. Oh, okay. Got it. Okay. Okay. Any other public comment? Okay. Um, panel participation in Nuclear Energy Innovation and Modernization Act requirements. Um, the panel has discussed this a little bit. The Issues Committee discussed it. Um, and um, one of the things, what, what, what part of what was discussed at the Issues Committee was, uh, I know Corey had wondered, you know, could the panel itself um, provide comments? And um, but the idea that was kind of, kind of kicked out was we could certainly talk about, like, the history of the panel and issues that we've taken on to date. But that certainly would not preclude individual panel members or anybody else from offering their own uh, testimony and ideas. Um, and we had members of the public at the Issues Committee who asked if the panel would uh, take public, uh, would include public comment on um, how uh, their ideas on uh, how, what IndyCab has done well, what has not done well, what best practices would be. But really, I mean, the members of the public have every bit of as much right and ability to communicate directly to the NRC on this matter. So I wouldn't vet your stuff through the panel. Um, I would just, I would suggest take that directly to the NRC, just unfettered, share what, share what you, you know, be candid, share what you think. Um, but Tony, I, I don't know if you shared it broadly, but Tony has actually taken a crack at a draft. And you want to describe what you drafted, Tony? Okay, uh, this is still on, yeah. Um, at um, Chairman Campney's uh, request, uh, I did start putting together just a summary history of how uh, the panel came to be uh, with a, uh, just a very general overview of the types of issues that the panel has examined so far. Uh, what I had hoped to do uh, today and was sidetracked with a, uh, with a personal issue uh, was I, I was hoping to summarize uh, specific issues uh, by going back through, uh, you know, the various handicap uh, pre, uh, meeting presentations and specifically saying things like we reviewed, uh, you know, Entergy's PSDAR submittal. You know, right now I, I just have that you know we've we've received uh, general reports from the plant owners, and you know I left it generic to cover both Entergy and North Star. Uh, but that that was uh, you know that that was just kind of a uh, well this is what we've done uh, we, we haven't uh, you know, I did not uh, put anything in on what we thought was good practices what wasn't good practices and that simply because that's really for the panel to decide. So um, do we know the timing yet of when they're going to schedule these meetings? I have not heard anything more about this. Uh, I can certainly, um, I, I do want to touch base with um, uh, some contacts I have with the congressional delegation 
uh, just to keep track of what's happening with this. Uh, I do know in discussing this with uh, several people at NRC headquarters and also the NRC Region 1 office, uh, there is a desire to have one of the public meetings uh, in the Vermont area. And uh, part of why this is is that one of, uh, one of the sponsors of the bill is uh, Senator Sanders. So uh, certainly, uh, you know, when, when you uh, decree that there will be 10 public meetings uh, nationwide on a particular subject, uh, you make certain that, you know, the areas of the country where the idea came from uh, are adequately covered. And uh, to that respect, I know, uh, Chris, you had submitted a letter requesting this, and then I elaborated on that and uh, passed that on to Commissioner Tierney for her approval, and uh, that was submitted as well. And just to be clear, this letter that I submitted was on behalf of Wyndham Regional Commission, not the panel, because I didn't have, didn't have the authority to do that. Um, yes, and one of the, I think the qualifications of meeting location is where a nuclear plant is currently being decommissioned, which narrows, which narrows the scope, yeah. uh, includes, definitely includes the rule. And I'll note that uh, the folk at Maine Yankee reached out to me. They had sent a letter um, also asking for a meeting to be held in New England, but they noted that they would, they also recognized the fact that their plants already had been decommissioned and they'd be happy to travel to Vermont. So I thought that was a nice show of support. But there's a lot of activity in New England, so who knows, maybe we'll get two. Um, yeah. what, what I recall of the criteria is, like you said, uh, active decommissioning, which we have, uh, and also existing panel. So there, there's certainly an existing panel here. Uh, you know, so, some of the other uh, decommissioned plants in New England still technically have panels, but they meet at most once a year. I think it also required a state that begins with V and ends with T. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, so hopefully we'll get a letter. So I guess the, the is at issue here is, um, so we don't know if, if this will be proposed before or if this will be actually a meeting would actually be held before or after we meet again. Um, and so I guess what I would like is some thumbs up, thumbs down uh, on uh, our folk okay with the idea of uh, basically sharing a summary history of how the panel was formed and what we've covered and the way it could be handled is Tony could get that draft out to folk and you could just get your comments to Tony but the decision by the panel would be in concept, is that okay? So that way we don't have to reconvene specifically to review that summary. So can I get a motion to that effect if folk are supportive of it, if somebody is supportive of it? Could you just clarify? Uh, what, 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 what would so the motion would be to uh, approve, if, if, if the commissioner is okay with her staff person drafting this thing, which has already begun drafting, uh, the uh, uh, would the panel support uh, uh, Public Service Department um, drafting a summary of the history and issues covered by nuclear decommissioning citizen advisory panel uh, for submission uh, to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission as part of the NEMA uh, public meeting? Can I just clarify, Chris? Is that what you mean by? Um the NEMA response that's referenced in the minutes of the issues committee meeting? That would be correct. Okay, very good. So just to put it on the record, I'm perfectly comfortable with uh, department staff uh, uh, undertaking that drafting exercise. I hope Allison... I still don't and understand what the, what, what the motion is. I have no problem with Tony drafting it. So th the motion is, are we okay with presenting that what Tony has just what basically be a history and summary of what NDCAP has, has discussed for presentation to the NRC at a meeting. Without any input from us? Or no, you'd be able to review and get comments to Tony. No, we'll get something to you. Uh, okay. If, if, was that also moved? We have a second? I'll second that. A discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, it sounded like a carry. All right. Uh, next item um, is, oh, it's me. Uh, summary of first nuclear decommissioning collaborative meeting. So um, Congress directed the Department of Commerce's U.S. Economic Development Administration 
to basically look at um, best practices, community best practices in response to nuclear plant closures. And I serve on um, an expert panel of uh, local officials. Um, and the inaugural meeting was held in D.C. in uh, kind of mid-April. And the inaugural meeting, the purpose of it was really to convene federal agencies um, to discuss what existing resources within their various programs could be brought to bear on uh, nuclear host communities. Um, and the participating agencies were Department of Commerce, U.S. Economic Development Administration, Department of Energy, uh, Environmental Protection Agency, U.S. Department of Agriculture, Housing and Urban Development, and Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And so a lot of the conversation, the, the, the expert panelists had an opportunity just to kind of share their um, experiences, but really the goal was for the federal agencies, I mean, you would, you would, uh, the things that we taken for granted in Vermont, because we're a pretty small state and pretty close knit, where it's pretty easy to get agency heads together or senior agency staff, uh, this was a pretty big deal in D.C. to actually get all these people in a room. And really it was about, hey, what programs do we have that could uh, be brought to address some of the economic uh, issues? And so, for instance, U.S. Economic Development Administration, um, in response uh, through the Conference of Economic Development Strategy process, there are certain resources that you can access through the EDA, Economic Development Administration. Um, Department of Energy, was really, they were there because um, they're trying to figure out what to do with the uh, spent fuel. Um, and one of the things that all, all the uh, uh, host communities brought up was the, so the host communities that were there was, uh, it was uh, represented from California, uh, who's working in communities, multiple communities in California on uh, nuclear plant decommissionings. Uh, Mayor Al Hill from Zion, um, and Eric Howes representing uh, Maine Yankee and Yankee Row. And they were all talking about um, a number of sites that have already been decommissioned, but the remaining spent fuel has caused issues related to uh, redevelopment. And so that really falls within the Department of Energy's wheelhouse. EPA was there because they have, uh, they have some community planning funds, but they also, of course, have a brownfields program. Um, U.S. Department of Agriculture, of course, has rural development programs, housing and urban development, has community development block grant programs, and then NRC was actually kind of the odd person out because, right, they really, they really um, um, oversee radiological health and safety. They don't really have other programs, and so um, it, it, you would you would think that they would have the most direct impact, but they they don't they're not really they don't really have funds available or programs that deal with uh, community impacts related to economic development. So the goal here, this wasn't like applying for grants or anything like that. It was, it was just basically getting the different agencies together to talk about what different programs they administer and if there are synergies among those programs. And one of the things that I'll, I'll just note that I pointed out to them, and this doesn't only relate to nuclear plant decommissionings, is for instance, a number of many of the Wyndham County, Wyndham Region uh, towns don't qualify for USDA grants because the, uh, the, it, the, the, the income targets are frankly too high. And so most of our communities qualify for loans, not grants. But one of the things that I brought up to them, and this is a, again, this isn't just really the nuclear plant decommissionings, but shouldn't there be more proactive and look at, because right now if you've got a nuclear plant in your community, you probably look pretty good economically. But if it's going to shut down and you're going to lose all of that income, you're probably not going to look so good pretty soon. So shouldn't some of the USDA rural development planning dollars that exist out there be able to go to communities that know something bad is going to happen um, and use, be able to have access to planning money in the form of grants, not loans, to be able to do that planning to figure out what the impacts are going to be. and that. You know, I know that some nuclear plants, you know, clo have cl had to close down pretty quickly without a lot of notice, like Maine Yankee, for exa example. But you know, Vermont Yankee was actually a fair amount of uh, amount of time, uh, and certainly now with Pilgrim uh, and, and other plants, we know that there's going to be some notice. So it'd be better if uh, agencies could could think proactively about making that planning funding available earlier, so that that communities can start. Um, looking at what those economic and so I would say I, I made the pitch too for socioeconomic impacts because it's not just 
economic, there's the loss of the people, the loss of the relationships and all. Um, so it's a good conversation and um, once I know the next steps, I'll let you know. You want to wait till public comments? Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Okay. That's actually general, we're actually coming up. So if anybody have any, so we don't really have comments from the panel for me. So we can go ahead and take the. No, oh, go ahead. Um, I'm wondering at the conference, uh, Al Hurd from Zion is one of the proponents, along with our own Congressman Welch, um, for seeking community compensation from DOE for having the waste on site stored for the next 20, 50, 100, 200 years. Um, was there any discussion about um, some of the legislated remedies to trying to recoup some of that um, compensation for doing the job of waste storage? Um, Al mentioned it to me and a couple of other panelists, but federal agencies don't talk about legislation. Um, that would be a no-no on their time. It, it was. It was more. Again, it was. It wasn't really. A, it wasn't really a conference. It was a very small round table. I guess total participate agency people. It was probably like 15 people, and then there were like uh, us four community people. So it wasn't really that kind. That may be something that comes up later. I think the next subsequent meetings would involve uh, uh, legislative staff or even legislators, and so that's when it would be more appropriate. But it's awkward for. Uh, agencies to talk about legislation. Any other questions for me from the panel before I ask? Just, before we... just one other thing. Uh, did did carbon footprint from shutting down one of these plants be taken into account by this committee, or was it even brought up? It, it wasn't that kind of discussion. It was about what fun what. Um, it wasn't about keeping plants open or closed. It was about what economic <laughs> development programs they have to help mitigate economic impacts. Just the economic impact? Mm -hmm. Carbon footprint didn't mean anything. It wasn't about environmental impacts. Okay. Yes, sir. I'm Josh Unruh, select board chair in the town of Vernon. I find it pretty disconcerting that uh, this panel attended or a member of this panel attended a, a uh, conference like that in our town had no input we had no representation we had no idea it even existed if this is a citizens advisory panel you need to get with the right citizens and that's us before you go try to represent us because this panel is not the host community we're the host community so in the future I'd like to be looped in please sure and again this discussion was about larger federal policy programs. But sure, happy to. Any other comments for the public? Okay, next item is scheduling remaining 2019 panel meetings and wrap up. Um, what the issues committee had suggested was that we consider meeting in September and November. I don't know that we need to nail down a date right now, but wanted to run that by the panel. The concern was that if we try to meet, past experience indicates if we try to meet in July or August, um, we start hitting vacations and school and other things like that. So the idea was to meet in uh, September, November. Does that make sense to folk? And the issues committee would meet uh, in between. We'd meet ahead of the September meeting and certainly ahead of the November meeting. I will note that in September, we have elections and I had agreed to run for one year and so someone else should be pondering who next takes the Iron Throne. Um, <laughs> oh, so no. so uh, take that into consideration. So that'll be an agenda uh, topic for September. Um, I don't think we need to choose a date right now unless folk already have their calendars or um, we met this time on a Monday to accommodate the legislators. That shouldn't be an issue, of course, in September. But is Monday, generally speaking, a good day or a bad day? Typically, before this, we'd met on Thursdays. <coughs> and I'm not seeing a whole lot of people clamoring for any particular day. Okay. So we will, Tony, if it's okay, I will go ahead and ask you to kind of do, a, do doodle polls 
for okay. September, November. Sure. Um, so we can go ahead and start pondering when. And I would imagine for November, obviously, I, I think we'd want to meet before Thanksgiving. Okay. Um, I'll just point out with September, uh, since we typically try to get a school site uh, we're not going to have access to the school calendars until the next school year starts. So, uh, you know, it's like I, I had this room reserved for today in like mid-February. Uh, I probably won't get a room or won't even have opportunity to book a room such as this until early September. Sure. So. But if we can go ahead and make a target date, that way at least we can. Okay. So, I, 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 I was just thinking that way people can start getting it on their books. We'll find some place. Uh, but uh, do folks want Mondays, or do uh, do folks want me to look at both Mondays and Thursdays? How about agent? The people that have to travel here the furthest are the um, state agency folk. Or is it, does it make a difference? Okay. Okay. All right. And then also remember, uh, for the November meeting, we will want to have the draft. Uh, um, report to the legislature and we may actually want to begin I think for uh, the September meeting we'll want to at least begin to have in their recommendations to the legislature regarding the composition of the panel and purpose and that kind of thing to go ahead and have some discussion around that okay so anything else that anybody wants to bring up before we adjourn June and then Lisa, Lisa. So um, I'm loath to prolong our agony, but um, if we're going to be discussing proposals in September for legislative changes, um, what is our vision about when we're going to discuss those proposals? And secondly, I appreciate your reminder that uh, we're going to be having elections in September. Um, uh, that sounds like an awfully full plate for this uh, committee. <laughs> I'm, I'm observing that. I'm, I'm uh, agonizing a little bit about how we're going to get all this done. Well, the idea would, and that's what I'm saying, we may need to spread this out a bit more, but so we can propose more meetings this year, if you like. Um, but my thinking was the issues committee would get things drafted up for discussion in September. Okay, now like I an initial idea. Now I understand. Thank you. And then we would also have November to take another crack at it. And if we're not ready, we're not ready. Lisa, do you have something? I was just wondering if the workers at the plant right now are those all union employees? Are they? There's no union employees involved with the um, dismantling. That's correct. Interesting. <coughs> okay. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So. All right, with that, we adjourn. Thank you.